Hello and welcome to Multifamily Investing Made Simple, the podcast that's all about taking the complexity out of real estate investing so that you can take action. Today, I'm your host, Anthony Vecino of Invictus Capital, joined as always by Dan. He doesn't know who wins the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial. Kruger. Does anybody? Is it over? We're recording it right now while the jury's deliberating. Really? So right now, at this moment in time, Dan and I, nobody in the world knows. But by the time that you, dear listener, are listening to this episode, there's a high probability that you know the answer to this. Depp wins. Get over to the comments and uh, leave a (laughs) review at iTunes and tell us who wins and what do you think about that? Um, I'm pretty sure I, I can't wait for this to be over so I can get my life back. I mean, it's really entertaining. I mean, it can really only go one way, right? I mean, it's like... I mean, I will lose entire all my faith in humanity if it goes the other way. But then again, OJ, OJ got off. Hey, if it doesn't fit, you must have... If, if the glove don't fit, you got to quit. Yeah. Um, there um, was nothing nearly as catchy as that in this trial. But all right, what are we doing here today, Dan? We're going to do a book route. Yeah, we're talking about King of Cap. Did you bring it in? Yeah, it's on the floor. Yeah, who's? Because <laughs> I forgot who. who Here it wrote is. It. It's on the table, people. So if you want to watch this um, at home, go over to YouTube to Multifamily Investing Made Simple. We got a book on the table. You can see our faces as we talk. It's great. Um, if you just like our voices, King down of Capital: The Remarkable Rise and Fall and Rise again. and Rise Again of Steve Schwartzman and Blackstone, written by David Carey and John E. Morris. Now, if you don't know who Blackstone is, it's probably it's probably the biggest company in the world that you've never heard of. Um, might be the biggest company in the world. They own everything. The big private equity firm. This book is actually really interesting because it walks through private equity and the, the evolution of it over the last 40-ish years. And we take it for granted these days that private equity is such a, such a ubiquitous part of investing and business life cycles. But there was a time when there really wasn't such a thing as you know, private equity as we know it now mm-hmm. with firms going out there with the idea of buying businesses, adding value or stripping them down to their components and then selling them. And it's a fantastic read. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I think one of the things was like coming out of the 80s, everyone thought that private equity and corporate raiders were like the same thing. Like everyone who was in private equity was a corporate raider and they were all going to buy a thing and strip it down and do what you just said. Yeah. But uh, really what, what a lot of these guys do, like um, Blackstone and, and you know, some of the you know really great guys that are in the industry is they, they do what we do with apartment buildings, but with businesses, they buy them, they make it better. They get a higher them. multiple, higher valuation, exactly. sell it, or yeah. they just keep operating it at a higher uh, profitability. Not a bad thing. At its, at its core, private equity, I think, is a really good thing. It's taking businesses that aren't doing great and making them better. It's exactly what it's we do. It's improving things. Exact same thing. So all this to say is like this book is interesting to us because we're not necessarily going out and buying businesses and improving them. Um, but if you think about uh, buildings as little businesses, then maybe that's exactly what we do. It is the exact same thing. All right. So here's the truth. So usually when we do these book reviews, Dan and I, we each come with like five mm. takeaways and we put them together in a beautiful visual infographic that we call the sophisticated investor notes, which if you want to get a copy of all the past ones, I think we've done like five or six at this point. Shoot me an email, anthony at invictusmultifamily.com, and I will send you the link to the folder where all of those are available. It won't cost you nothing. But here's the thing. For this book, I actually really struggled to come up with takeaways, things that I remember. I I remember the story being engaging. I really enjoyed it, but I didn't come up with too many takeaways. Dan did. So we're going to dive into Dan's takeaways. I think he's got about six. I got one, and we'll unpack them together. How's that sound? Let's, Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, take it away. All right, number one, uh, which one to do first? I guess the one thing that, I, the, the one I want to start with. No, I we think, did that book review last time. The one thing. Oh, hush. <laughs> hush. The thing I want to start with <laughs> is that just in general, the period of like the 80s and the 90s, I've read a lot of books recently about stuff that happened in this period. And this is the same period that Blackstone came out of. It was a very active uh, and um, active and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Changing. Give me a synonym for changing. Evolving? Yes. Well, there was a lot of evolution that happened. I guess I'll phrase it like that. A lot of things changed. And what I noticed re- with reading uh, Trillions, which is about the evolution of uh, the index funds. And uh, what else have I read about this period? Uh, there was another one, too. I can't remember. Obviously, you ever read Barbarians Campbell. at the Gate? Of course. Yeah. That was a long time ago. <laughs> of course. Well, yeah. <laughs> my kind of I'm sorry. Who do you think I am? Yeah. I'm Dan, of course Dan I it's been a long time, actually. But um, there was something else. I mean, there's was trillions. Obviously, this one, there's something else I'm blanking on. But a lot of stuff happened in that time period, which when you kind of whittle it down, what happened was some of these little private old boy club markets like private equity and, and things like this 
got turned into something that was brought to the mainstream. And a lot of wealth was created, and it, it kind of ties nicely into something that, that Naval Ravikant talks a lot about, where he's like, you find something that people need, and you then provide it at scale. And that's what a lot of these guys do, whether it be index funds or private equity. They took something that was private and pretty much brought it to the masses, and that's the scale piece. So I just was one of the takeaways I, I thought about was how this this was the value add that they brought. They took something that existed and then put it on steroids, just made it big. Um, and it was, I think, important for me because I'm, I'm listening to Naval a lot because I was preparing for this uh, meeting that we're going to have on his book. And that's kind of a consistent theme with what Naval says is you take something that people need and you deliver it at scale. And that's exactly what all these guys were doing in the 90s and the 80s. I mean, if you look at all the businesses that Blackstone owns at this point and what their pro like their total revenue probably is, it's probably in the trillions, right? Like across I don't their know. entire portfolio. Revenue? I don't know. Um, they, they've, they've managed to bring it to the masses. We'll say that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. What else you got? What's number two? Number two. Um, they started with a lot of JVs early on. I just thought that yeah, was fun. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, There's a corollary there <laughs> with, with real estate investing. Um, you know, a lot of people think that they can jump straight into syndication, jump straight into like the private equity acquisition um, mode. But really, like JVs is where everybody, like a lot of people start out. And then even as they get bigger, they go back to joint venture. Sounds so familiar. they have this period right? where they go like the rise, <laughs> the fall, the rise again of Steven Schwartzman was yeah. like correlated with the JV and then bringing in massive um, retail investors and then kind of getting back to more, more of the... Um, uh, the joint Jimmy's, ventures, like yeah. working with billion dollar f wealth funds and, mm -hmm. and other companies that banks that can, that's another interesting thing, actually, that the, the banks for these, like these acquisitions, they'll do participatory loans. Like that whole, that whole model came from this world where yeah. there was a, and you might have this actually, but I just remember this where they were trying to get these big deals done, like billion dollar acquisitions. And the banks are like, well, we love this, but we don't have the, we don't have the, the money on hand. So we're going to, one of the guys from Blackstone went off, spun this thing, and you started going to different banks and saying, hey, let's participate, bring our funds together to do this thing. To, and that's a whole different... Yeah, yeah. that's another th one of the things I was thinking about when I was talking about the 80s and 90s, all the stuff that came out of that was with the, uh, the junk bonds, right? Um, a whole other element of the cap stack that became used quite a bit, which is basically just high-yield bonds, which is great for guys like this who don't mind paying some higher interest to, to get more capital and use more leverage, but between index funds, junk bonds, like the the um, the more sophisticated debt structures these guys came up with. I mean, a lot of stuff was was created in this time period. And it's, it's pretty exciting just so, to kind of see all the stuff that was happening then. Uh, some, some of it good. Busy. Yeah, it was Some of it good. ultimately, like, remember, like the name of this book is all around the rise, the fall, and the rise again. Like, there was a fall in there. Um, Whoops. And it, some of it had to do with some, like, some of these creative shenanigans. Um, I mean, more debt is not... Always good. Not it's always not good. <laughs> so you get too levered up and things uh, things aren't too bad. But that actually kind of ties nicely into debt is like Prosecco. It's good in moderation. Yeah. Or not true. at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Prosecco, not at all. Debt, moderation. Uh, but that ties in nicely with the one of my other takeaways was that they, they shared a lot of the similar uh, business philosophies that we do, specifically super conservative, prioritizing high cash, uh, asymmetric risk reward deals where a lot of their counterparts in this period where there was kind of a fall um you know we're, we're getting really levered up and just doing risky risky deals but these guys prioritized cash and running a lean operation which was a big takeaway for me because it, it's what we do and i was like oh great blackstone does the same stuff they have the same kind of core philosophies that contributed to their success that feels good yeah. it kind of gives me confirmation that we're on the right track even if we're moving a little bit slower out of being conservative there, there became this race it seemed like in the 80s and the 90s to have to be the one to raise the next biggest fund. Mm -hmm. So it started with like, oh, they raised the first billion dollar fund. The next guy came across and they're like, the, the first two billion, three billion, four billion. And there was like this race between not just Blackstone, but then what's it, like KKR, um, these other private equity firms to kind of keep one upping one another in ever increasing bids to have like the biggest deployment of funds. And it kind of came to a head with the, you know, Barbarians at the Gate, the whole RJR Nabisco takeover where it's like paying incredible, incredible multiples, almost simply for the sake of being able to say, look how much we paid for the thing, even though it wasn't really tied to the underlying performance of the asset. And that can be, it can be really tempting even given where we're at right now in the market cycle to be like, nobody ever goes into buying a building thinking like, I wanna be the one who pays the most for it. 
But people definitely like bragging after the fact and being like, oh yeah, we just had a $50 million acquisition without really mm-hmm. unpacking, okay, but was the acquisition only worth 40? <laughs> it's nice to be able to say, we did 50 million, right? Like, Yeah, so I think with RJR, I think a lot of that was driven by just uh, the fees uh, and specifically the comp packages for, um, oh, I forgot his name. Um, who is the, uh, the president, CEO of RJR Nabisco? I don't remember. Name. Yeah, I forgot his name. But I mean, the the package that guy walked away with. Who, oh, the parent of God. <laughs> like, that's what was the incentive. Like, yeah. who cares how much we pay for the company? My bonus for this transaction is, I mean, it's huge. I mean, that's millions, a, hundreds of millions. In hundreds the, of millions. In the, of millions. In, the, in the 90s, I think, it's early bonkers. 90s. It's bonkers. Yeah. And it's, it's the Insane. same thing, uh, again, with syndication with real estate and operators is uh, making sure that the, the the incentives, the fiscal alignment is there. And I think that's something, um, one of the really cool takeaways I do recall from this book is that one of Schwartzman's management growth techniques is to find somebody brilliant who's really competent and great at the thing, put them into the seat and start like spin off an entire new division, a new company, give them equity in it and be like, go build it. Like that's where BlackRock came from which is like they've now spun off, but BlackRock was a subsidiary of Blackstone and now BlackRock is like the largest owner of real estate. Like that was the focus. The guy was like, I'm great at real estate. So he's like, focus on that. Mm-hmm. And put brilliant people into the seat and let them go. Yeah, I think they're uh, they're bigger now, right? Blackstone. Black even. Is BlackRock bigger than Blackstone? Yeah, I think BlackRock is well, I wouldn't bigger. be surprised. I think, uh, don't quote me on that. Like, it's, it's really hard, I think at a certain point with a company like Blackstone, because you don't even know necessarily what all they got their fingers into yeah in a lot of ways it's, it can be i, I mean, mean you can figure it out a lot but of it would take private so long. a lot of it's private markets so it's yeah. like some of us how do you how do you value that stuff yep. um let's see another one um oh, this one's kind of fun you'll appreciate this anthony uh they started the first office was three thousand sixty four square feet how big is ours it's got to be way lot smaller I think is, we're, like we're just, just, no, no, we're bigger than that. I think we're around we're, 2,000. Oh, we're just, just shy. Really? This office? I mean, if you count the storage, it's not all functional, but the, the footprint <laughs> of the unit. We got big in, arches, people. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a work. It's yeah. Anyway. So, I mean, you can run a lean operation, I guess, which is basically what I'm trying to get at. They ran a lean operation. They grew to a very big size, with very small headcount, very small footprint. They didn't go get the big grandiose office. They kept it lean and they focused on growth, which I think aligns really well with us. It makes me feel better about, you know, keeping it uh, conservative. You know? No, I like that. And also part of their acquisition strategy or I think it's really telling why they succeeded in a lot of cases was they were only looking at deals that they knew they could go in there and actually improve. Complete tangent to the, the office space, mm-hmm. which is is very good. But it's also coming to me that one of the things that they were really good at is staying in the lane, mm-hmm. evaluating opportunities through the lens of, can we actually improve this? Not Not just saying, is there improvement to be had, but actually asking, can we do it? Yeah. Because a lot of times, like, you can see opportunity and be like, oh, yeah, it's just so simple. You're going doing this and this and this and the other thing. But really, like, you don't have the core competency or the skill to go do it. So it's one thing to recognize what needs to be done, another to actually be able to go do it. And they were really good at saying, like, recognize the opportunities and couple it with the capacity to go execute it. Yeah, that's what's interesting about the private equity model compared to ours is, like, the, me- the mechanics of what's happening is almost exactly the same, except instead of buying businesses, we buy properties. But we're effectively doing the same thing over and over again. And there's obviously private equity groups that focus on the same uh, market, same type of business. But with guys like this and KKR, KKR, I mean, they'll have a really diverse portfolio of different businesses. So almost every deal is going to be a completely different animal, and they've got to bring in all these different experts. So it's and this isn't a takeaway from the book. It's just kind of an observation of private equity in general. It's it's, it's infinitely more complex, I think, than what we do because. It's, each business is its own little animal, but apartment buildings are pretty similar. They're their own, they have their own nuances, but it's uh, it's comfortable kind of going and buying multiple apartment buildings, mm-hmm. whereas if we're doing businesses, I feel like it would be a whole different can of worms each time. Well, one thing that does stand out to me, though, with private equity firms and, like, reading this book is that um, one of the, the ways that these guys, and these guys are really smart. Like, they're really brilliant people. They're way smarter than we are, for sure. Like, we're just dumb real estate investors going by buildings. It's really simple. But one of the ways that they would go and add so much value is through financial engineering, which is probably one great way to add value to any business is really understanding, like, how to manage the cash flows, receivables, payables, all that st- all that jazz, and, like, engineer it in a way 
that can maximize profitability. Now, with that said, you can also overly engineer a thing, which I think got into the the fall part of the equation is like at some point, um, too much engineering is now manipulation and becoming very detrimental potentially. Well, yeah, I mean, the more complex things get, the harder it is to figure out where all the potential pitfalls and landmines are. That's why we like basic, simple things. Uh, we can usually pretty accurately quantify what the downside is, but if you get something that's, you know, exotic and then, you know, rocket science of the finance world where like you need a, an engineer to tell you what the heck's going on, um, there's probably a lot of things that could go wrong. If, you, if you're sitting in a meeting and you need to bring in like PhDs to explain the finances and stuff to you, I'm like, it's yeah. too much for me. I don't want any part of that. Thank yeah. you, but no. No thanks. <laughs> No, thanks. It's good for somebody out there, not me. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, there were a lot of crickets at the launch. Not the launch, but the first fundraise. There were crickets. Um, these guys came out of Lehman Brothers, I think. Good network uh, of, of people and of, of investors. So they came out confident when they launched their fund and they were going to sent out all these, I was going to say emails, but probably letters. Um, they sent out all these letters to everybody and said, hey, we're launching this great fund. You all know us. We've done a bunch of business at Lehman Brothers. This is going to be amazing. And Correct. Awesome. I mean, they awesome. ended up raising a lot. They, they got it. Context is interesting here, right? When we say like they struggled, like they were raising large sums of money. Right? It actually wasn't that big on the first one. I mean, it, obviously, this but was like a long time ago. Like, but yeah, for like yeah, yeah. in Blackstone numbers, that's... But, but uh, like, oh. there's there's two takeaways here. One is everybody struggles on their first. And probably second. Probably a second. Like, yeah, raising capital is hard. But then two, from even the beginning, their level of success and failure was just a di was just different. Their expectations were, were well, high. They came, yeah, they came from Lehman Brothers. Yeah. So they were already on Wall Street talking. And this was Wall before Street Lehman numbers. Brothers became Le Lehman Brothers. As, it was as, getting there. As we know it now. And I, I know there's no Dick Fold yet, but it was it was moving that direction. Talk about, talk about parachute. Uh, golden parachutes. What did he get? I don't remember. <sighs> Not jail Gold? time. Oh well, yeah, he's <laughs> that's what he deserves. Did anybody? No, <laughs> like one guy, <laughs> like one person. Yeah, <laughs> one one poster child. Um, there's there's another one I pulled out. It's actually. like they drew his hat out, his name out of a hat. They're like, all right, who, who's uh, going to jail? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> Doug. Doug. Yeah, Doug. You're, you're the scapegoat. <laughs> Probably Doug's first day too. All right, uh, last one. This this was kind of in the maybe pile. Um, but, uh, where did it go? Oh yeah. There was a lot of fee income that generated, uh, the income needed for growth early on. Uh, and this one kind of hit close to home because, uh, we're at a very similar stage in our growth and, you know, we're kind of looking at like, how can we make our deals the best and the easiest for investors? And, you know, we look at the fees and things like that. And sometimes there's pushback on it and people think that, oh yeah, you guys don't need to charge fees and you know, be greedy. You just make your money off the real estate. But like, we actually do need to pay for our overhead early on in a business. You've got to generate some kind of cash flow to pay for all the things to get the business going. And that's where the, the fees come in. But um, they did a lot of consulting work, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not interesting. I just, uh, it makes sense. They did a lot of merge and acquisition consulting. So high ticket, very expensive, very low overhead. Uh, to generate fees. Obviously, it wasn't long-term what they wanted to be doing. They wanted to be doing deals, but they needed cash to pay the rent, pay the people, and do all the things. And so, uh, you know, they they charged a lot of fees. And it wasn't from a place of greed. Um, so I guess my takeaway here was don't feel bad about charging fees. You need the fees to pay for the overhead, to grow the business, to provide more opportunities. So that was my takeaway uh, from the whole fee thing. Yeah, I don't feel bad about fees. I think fees are just, they're necessary. If you want to invest with the best companies, then they need to have the cash flows to be able to reinvest into the growth, into like the system, the processes, the people, all that stuff, and it costs money. And you don't want to invest into a company whose only payday is once every five years, right? Like you want them to have strong cash flow position in the interim because if something happens in those in that gap between the five years, then they're they're done. The investment's done, and so that's not good for anybody. It's not good for anybody. Um, and we could go deeper into the fees, but here's here's my here's my one takeaway that I had written down and. Um, it says, good. it says, focus on what you do well. There will always be other opportunities and people may very well capitalize on them. It doesn't mean you will. And it goes back to what I was saying before about recognizing like there might be an opportunity in front of you, but you might not be the one that can actually go capitalize on it. For case in point, when we, over the last year, we've been looking at development deals. We can see that there's opportunity there, but we're not really the right ones to go capitalize on it because we don't have the skills, the competency, the experience, any of the things really that would help us go and, and um, execute 
excellently. Whereas when we see a multifamily deal, it's like, yeah, we know exactly what to do. The confidence is high. So we can go to our investors with, you know, um, a high degree of certainty. Like when we say this is what's going to happen, this is likely what's going to happen just because we have a track record, have experience there. So it's just another vote for staying in your lane, I guess, which is interesting because Blackstone is they're so they're in so many different lanes. But at its core, I think they did a good job of staying in the lane of always recognizing where you can add value and don't go into the pool of, I don't know why a pool, but, but don't go into any pools where you don't think that you can add value. Yeah, I mean, I rarely see a pool that I think I can improve. I'm not really a pool guy. Yeah, don't go into any pools where all you Actually, see is Actually, don't go into any pools like, at all. Um, avoid most pools. I, I, stay out of, I stay out of most pools because... People pee in them. I, I know what I do in pool. Like when I was young, I know. Yep. I know. I know. We don't need the details. And you know, you know what happens in a pool. You guys know. Unless you have your own pool, don't go in a pool. Mm. Please do it for me. Stay out of the pool. And that's that, all I got. I don't know where to go with that one. Yeah. Stay out of the pool. Stay out of the pool, people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my big takeaway from this book, King of Capital. Stay out of the pool. Um, make sure. Didn't even read the book. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, you did. You did. Um, I don't know if that, means, if that was my one takeaway. Stay out of the pool. Stay out of the pool, you guys. Chapter. I think you read the wrong book. Oh, shoot. Oh, check it out. It's good. Um, that's all we got. Is it? Oh wait, no, no, no. Oh yeah, I read the wrong bo- book. I, I thought it was King of Capool. Oh, Cap- Cap- all right, we should have ended this already. All right, we got to go, people, because we've obviously <laughs> it's hit, getting worse, and we've We're hit done. the point of no return. We appreciate you. Uh, if you haven't already, do, 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 please go leave a review. I know I say this every single episode, and you probably tune me out. You probably have already turned me off at this point. But if you're still listening to this and you haven't left a review, seriously, it makes a huge difference to Reed's livelihood. Seriously, he only gets he gets paid per review. Mm-hmm. He's he been working, been paid in weeks. He hasn't been paid for weeks. Give this, help this <laughs> He's guy. Really hungry. He's hungry. Help him out. So go leave a review. For feed me. Reed. <laughs> Hashtag feed Reed. Be in t-shirts. <laughs> And uh, we'll see you in the next episode.